The Gift is a 2015 psychological thriller film written and directed by Joel Edgerton, starring Jason Bateman, Rebecca Hall, and Joel Edgerton. This is a mid-century modern home. This view is fantastic. The lighting is great. You like it? Yeah, do you? This is good. <laughs> I'm very happy. Excuse me, is your name Simon? Yes, sir. It is you. Hi. We went to school together. This is my wife, Robin. This is, I didn't get your name. Gordon Mosley. Uh, Gordo. Gordo? Oh, my God. I'm so sorry I didn't recognize you. It's been a very, very long time. <laughs> what the hell was that? That was big. <laughs> Gordo! What does bygones be bygones mean? It's over! Simon has a full file on him. You think he's been lying to you? Just tell me what happened. It's 25 years ago. I have no idea who you really are. Simon says, new house. Simon says, beautiful wife. Simon says, you think you're done with the past, but the past is not done with you. Welcome back to the Cult of Films. I am so happy to be here because it is a true gift to be joined by these two guys. Once again, that is Mr. Coleman Yeti and Johnny Mulligans. Welcome back, gentlemen. Hey, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Much obliged. <laughs> well, hey, let's talk There's... about a 2015 film. Why are we talking about this? Because it's pretty fucking good, and I think that this has a little bit of a cult following. Uh, so tonight I am joined by a rogue Newport Days Hazy Pale IPA. Or no, it's just a pale ale. So cheers, gentlemen. Let's get it done. What do you guys got? Yes, Abominable by Urban Hopworks Brewing out of Portland. Uh, you can <laughs> see really well with my background. You should hold it in front of you. <laughs> it's so bright where you are, Coleman, that it's just like completely taking over. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it is. It's 9.30 at night in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> and the sun is it's amazingly bright right now beating down yeah yeah <laughs> your beer is like the the helicarrier you know it has that reflective <laughs> you know technology the helicarrier johnny on tonight's tonight's brought to you by i don't know how you pronounce it lafroig 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 yes lafroig select i said so lafrog like a, yeah lafro lafrog the frog um, yeah i i got <laughs> I this this is a is. If if you're if you're like a big Parks and Rec fan and you like Lagavulin but you don't want to pay the Lagavulin price, you can get that this bottle for uh thirty to forty dollars less, and then you balance it out with a little water and you get a really similar experience. You know, quality wise, not quite there, but it's close. It's good. Is it more on the like McKellen like honey characteristics, or is it more no. like you're licking a conch? It's what? more like. <laughs> It's no, more no. like if you burn band-aids in a campfire, mm. that's the flavor you get out of Lafroy. I personally love it, but see, this one I think they held back on the band-aids a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a bit it's a little more no, it's it's a little more of that um PD salty background to it, but it's not as intense as like an art bag. Uh and it's not quite as rounded and balanced out like a Lef like a leg of woolen. So it, it's it's somewhere in the middle. It's a good one. I still like it. It's good stuff. It's a hard pass for me, dog. But let's talk about the movie. Uh, the, you know, because alcohol is the gift that keeps on giving. But we're talking about a film tonight. Uh -huh. And lately, uh, you know, I, I felt like uh, Blumhouse really had a, a standard of quality as far uh -huh. as films went. Because they, they just kind of exploded onto the scene. And they had movies like this. And I feel like lately... <laughs> They haven't been, they're more of like just kind of churning out, you know, schlocky horror, which is kind of a like a cool double standard, though, because like now it, it just gives voices to, to lower budget and like, uh, you know, new filmmakers that probably wouldn't have had the opportunity to get films made. And Blumhouse is now allowing for filmmakers to do that, which I'm all on board for because you should definitely support indie film, especially indie horror. But this is kind of when Blumhouse was really churning out some high quality. And this, this film is definitely high quality, which you would never, at least from you know my opinion, we'll get into your guys' opinions. Um, but f especially for the budget, this film costs $5 million to make. Wow. Are you kidding me? Yeah. In 
Same. For the amount of quality and the actors <laughs> that she had, $5 million budget, and this film made $59 million. So not surprising, right? So this is Joel Edgerton, who is known mostly as an Australian actor who's been in a ton of things. This is uh, his directorial debut. So not only was this only a $5 million budget, this is a right out of the gate. This is his first time at, at the plate uh, directing something. Yeah, this is a great this movie. Is the first, this is the first go for him, and that, and he got a solid cast, and that's really incredible. Yeah, it's not like there's a ton of people in the cast. You had, what, like three people headlining. Yeah. You had more people, but, you know, for the actual people that – the top build cast, which I right. think $5 million, Jason Bateman probably garnered at least – at least a million of that, unless this was a favor. Yeah, I you mean, would think so, because he's got to be five mil plus easy for most roles that he does at this point. For sure. For sure. Well, what did you guys think of the gift? I think it was a great slow cooker. It, they put plot twists in there, and it, but it's sort of like a they peel back little layers of it. You get little bits and pieces as you're going along about the challenge that the wife is having with wanting to have a baby and some of these like details about how she's knowing less and less about her husband. And I like the way they set it up. And this kind of like this transition of your, like the first half of the movie is just cringy. You're just like, Oh God, that's like all these, these like awkward social in interactions and just weirdness and it's just like this is just so cringy and weird and you're getting through and you get to the, like this slow point in the middle and then more pieces start getting peeled off and you're finding out that the creepiness is really more about Bateman's character actually being an asshole and like you you go from being creeped out by one guy to hating the other one and it was I love that I love the way they move it along i love the way they opened up the details and like you can like figure things out and if you as you get into if you watch if you're into watching lots of movies and kind of like breaking them down you start to see the cues the cues are there but it's not quite like blunt like a sledgehammer sometimes you like they give you a twist and they punch you in the face with it but this one i felt like they opened it up a little a little more you know with a little more finesse it made me feel funny and i like it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, kind of to piggyback on what Johnny said, just the way that it was done. So, you know, you're screaming at the wife, at least I was throughout it, like, what are you doing? You know, and yes, you can call it socially awkward, but at the same time, you're going, okay, there's like major red flags all over the place here. Why are you inviting someone into your house? And those are the parts that don't go away. I'm still screaming at the wife. Okay, there's a creepy dude. Like, why do you feel bad for him? Why do you keep having him come in? Whatever. And it makes a little more sense towards the end once once you see that Bateman was such an asshole uh, throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of start feeling for the creepy guy, but he's still super creepy. <laughs> right. And then, of course, the way that the movie ends is, like, ridiculously creepy. And you're kind of just left not knowing who to feel good for you really just feel sorry for the wife because she's the one that got screwed in all of this maybe maybe and we'll right. just say spoilers throughout i mean this right, is a, right. this came out what six years ago now so you can't talk about this movie and really like dig into it without spoiling kind of everything and, and let's be totally yeah. honest if it's after opening weekend all bets are off i'm sorry Fair. you had the opening weekend yeah okay. so uh yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really well done. And I really like the way that you're left wondering that it's got that open ending. And the person that I was watching it with goes, well, why can't they just finish it? Like, <laughs> is it or is it not? And I'm like, like, that's kind of the point. That's the point. You just have to left wondering and feeling bad about all of it. Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> just feel gross at the end <laughs> and it's yeah it's kind of yeah like you're, you're kind of rooting for the for the creepy guy at the end when you're but you're reminding yourself oh wait he just oh did he oh yeah. i don't know what's oh, <laughs> no <laughs> this is terrible but it's great it's the worst and best at the same time like yeah feeling torn apart from the inside 
Right, but I watched it twice, and the common theme is I'm still, even knowing what's happening, I'm still screaming at the wife. Just in basic <laughs> social, you know, interactions, what the hell are you doing? It's like she's <laughs> never watched a horror movie in her entire yeah, life. Oh, this guy, this guy, how did he find out where you live? Oh, he just showed up at your back door? Oh, you might as well give him a tour. <laughs> <laughs> She's deeply. Fl- I, I mean, that's the point, though. Is I I feel like they're all deeply flawed, and that like the movie has to peel back scene by scene, layer by layer, to for it to kind of make sense why everyone is just acting so awkward with each other. And it's just, right. so quick synopsis is uh, you have this couple, this married couple, Simon and Robin. They have moved back to L.A. area. And this this guy, this friend from back in the day named Gordon, who goes by Gordo, or at least, you know, uh, Simon calls him Gordo, like a grown man. I would never call a grown man Gordo, uh, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, he, they catch up at a mall. And then, uh, you know, it, it's it what turns in what seems to be harmless as a person from the past that, like, comes by and is, like, giving them gifts uh, and showing them around and, and inviting them over for dinner and whatnot turns out to be a little bit more nefarious than what it seems on the surface level. I think this is a Hitchcockian style thriller. Like Johnny, you said it perfectly. It's a complete slow burn. And the thing is, is it's so tension filled. Everything is uncomfortable. This is one of the most like sphincter squeezing, uncomfortable (laughs) movies to watch because it's, and it's all implied like on face value Nothing really happens in this movie. Yeah, it's not yeah. a blood fest. It's not a no any any of that. There's not. It's it's a total Hitchcock throwback because it, the horror is only uh, it's only a horror film in implication. The viewer and how it's set up is we're creating the plot uh, of of the film, and that's kind of like a fun game to play. Although you know, albeit very uncomfortable. But literally, Joel Edgerton is giving us the tools, and it's our job to build the house that we're watching. So that's a really fun, different take on filmmaking. And again, for a first-time filmmaker, I think that's pretty incredible. For the first half, you're you're waiting. You're like, okay, where's the blood and gore? When is the, like the the, the ultimate struggle going to happen in the physical confrontation? It never arrives. We get dead fish. De- there's dead, yeah, yeah right. there's dead fish. And well, it's it's the most, and it's it's dog, the most yeah. passive aggressive <laughs> physical altercation you can ever get. I killed your goldfish. Yes, I know they're they're koi fish. Don't worry, please. Anyway, the but it's like I like that aspect. The other thing I liked about this one is going this kind of trend for the two that we're going to be fe- you know talking about in the series here is. The actors, I feel like Jason, uh, an actor like Jason Bateman, I feel like he has been kind of typecast, like in in certain ways. You know, I see Jason Bateman. I think, I think Arrested Development. I think, um, what is it? The Terrible Bosses, the one where he horrible bosses, like, yeah, the horrible bosses. Like there, there's a style to his acting, there's a style to his characters, and it's kind of it's a it does he does break from. And I think in like Ozark, he's not. I haven't seen Ozark, but I, I don't think it's not a comedy. He's very different in Ozark. Isn't yeah, he more like so, this in Ozark, though? Coleman? Yeah, he, yeah. He's now trying to break free of that like super nice guy typecast that he's had for so long, and he's like branching out into some of these other projects where he gets to be like creepy or an asshole or whatever. Yeah, but see, even even I could look at this role and then look back to some of his typecast stuff, and I can see the elements there. It's like totally. It's it's you know. It's what's his name? Is he my, what is he in that rest development? Michael? Yeah. <laughs> he plays Mike. Yeah. It's Michael, but he's actually successful and he's actually like a nefarious D bag that actually does horrible things to people as opposed to half ass plots that never happen. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's like they took those pieces, they brought it in, and then they applied it to a new piece of acting that created this this new application i like that i like taking a typecast and plugging it into a different role that actually fits that typecast very well and i think that worked here a hundred percent and it it works because unlike some other actors that went from comedy to more serious roles that we've even talked about on this uh, channel before like Jim Carrey or uh, Will Ferrell it's it's not even much of a stretch because he's still doing his deadpan Jason Bateman delivery and Jason Bateman's shtick as an actor is I'm the only sane person in the room 
And that that's just like how he that's how he like, you know, his personality goes off because he's always just like eye rolling and kind of like slapping his own head, kind of like a like a Seinfeld or like a Larry David, but a little less Jewish. Um, he is. Uh, but what makes it different in this is that everyone else is kind of on his level. No one's no one's sane in this. So. It's either it's either you put him in as the the normal person and then like the cartoon characters make his deadpan and like the straight man thing like funny or if he's now on equal footing as anyone else that's when he now comes off as demeaning and arrogant and everyone mm-hmm. else kind kind of comes off as normal where he, I I feel like his shtick was always he was kind of an asshole because it's almost even worse than like something like an arrested development because now he's making fun of these crazy people but now you put him you know together with other people that are just as you know going through it as, as he is or he is going through it as they are and now he just comes off as a bully and that's really called out in this movie and really captured really well that's why like you said Johnny it's more of a seamless transition because really he's still doing the same thing yeah, hmm. I, I felt that that way about this one for sure. I did not get that. Okay, but I did. I, I guess one of the things, and in, in, in watching it twice again, so there's certain things in movies like foreshadowing that it's really clear. Like it's a really clear moment. This is going to play into the film later on. So like when Weirdo Gordo is in their house, which he shouldn't be, and is just going into rooms that of people he doesn't no (laughs) and looking through their shit and he picks up the monkey and she goes oh you know simon is like really really afraid of monkeys like terrified of them like okay well that's a moment where they're clearly going to bring this in later in the movie but when i went back and i watched it watched it again um there was so much foreshadowing in the beginning of the movie and just really slight like little nuanced pieces of foreshadowing of like, this is how this is going to come into the movie later towards the beginning of the movie. There's a shower scene where she like, you know, is in the shower and like looks out to see what's out there and and nothing's out there. She just heard a noise, whatever. And then cut to later where she's in the shower again. And she has the dream where Gordo's right in her face. So there's just a bunch of little stuff that you go. I didn't, I didn't notice that the first time around that that was kind of, you know, foreshadowing things that would be happening later in the film. So, so tightly wound that I was kind of annoyed the first time I saw it. I, I watched this a couple of years ago and that's why I suggested, but I just rewatched it recently, you know, to brush up for this episode. And I was just like, I don't remember this many like jump scares, but they're not even really like, then I thought about it. I'm like, that wasn't even a, a jump scare. They earned every bit of Gatorade bottle falling over and making a loud noise and making you kind of, you know, jump because it earns the tension. Like, because the entire time it's all tension filled because like I said before, nothing really of consequence happens it as as far as a traditional horror film goes there's no right. it's not a slasher film it's it's not no one's behind, you know hiding behind the closet and jumping out there might be someone behind the closet but it doesn't you it doesn't play to you that you never see him exactly right. no, no. it's it's He's all only... in the back of your head and even the scene or, where you brought up the shower scene i didn't that was it's still probably my least favorite scene of the of the film because i feel like the the rest of the movie is smarter than the dream sequence where mm-hmm. if it just stopped on her, on her like kind of looking out and it's like really blurry and foggy and you see, and, and that like makes you jump right there where you just slowly see someone walking and you're like, fuck, I have no idea who that is. But then she, she like clears the thing and it's his face. And I'm like, oh God, you just like sinister bagooled said booed me. And th- this movie is smarter than that. I, 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 you know. There, there's like that was a, a false jump scare, which I would love to give the, the film shit for. But everything else, like the dog, like that was earned. Like she's yeah. Yeah. walking through the house, and it's not just like it was dead silence, and she's walking through the house like a normal horror film. You could hear the dog noise, so you know, like you're the whole time your brain's just like the dog's outside. The dog is fine. It's just like when the fuck are you gonna reveal it? And then they slow roll it so much, you're like, oh god, is the dog fine? Is the dog outside? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, and the, also the windows, mm, they are yeah, yeah. 
it's like the whole there that that the whole point that the house had these massive windows, no privacy whatsoever. Right. No. Like everywhere. That right there, that set it up was like, okay, so somebody's somebody's stalking and watching them. We know there's a creepy guy, there's all windows, and these people clearly don't know how to buy curtains. So <laughs> Right. The creepy guy pointed it out in the beginning. Right. You bought Here, a I glass, got cleaner. Some glass cleaner because you got so many windows in here. <laughs> Oh, yeah, see that? The was... symbolism and foreshadowing? You're like a fish in a fishbowl, so I got you the fish. <laughs> and then I killed the fish because I'm going to kill it. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> but that, you know what? That, that play, the, the whole glass thing, that payoff of that, I guess, ongoing, I don't know, scare, I guess, was the. It, it had nothing to do with Gordo. It had nothing to do with the pro or the antagonist. It had to do with the the guy that he badmouthed to get the job. You, you know, oh yeah, that the, was great. That was great, <laughs> right? It was and, and it was loud. It wasn't a traditional jump scare. It was during a party. Everything was well lit and loud, and then boom, like a, a rock just keeps going through the window, and it turned out to be something completely so unrelated because that's what's so fun about this movie is you're like again in your brain you're like okay. Jason Bateman's the the protagonist. The wife is the secondary character, and Gordo's the the uh, or Joel Edgerton rather is the is the villain of the movie. And then it starts going along, and, and by the end of it, you're just like, okay, so Rebecca Hall's character was really the main character because she's the POV that we're going through and finding out everything with. Like right. every time that something's revealed to her, it's revealed to us, the audience. You know, we're making assumptions of what's going on, but. We're really like going through the motions with her, so she's really the main character. Gordo's really the victim, kind of, and then fucking Jason Bateman's really the the, the antagonist. And I and I loved how they establish all the rules and then break the rules. And mm-hmm. if it wasn't done right, if anyone were to drop the ball at all, this the fucking wheels would have fallen off this movie quick. No, oh, for there, sure, there wasn't there wasn't a single dent in the in the armor. The one thing I'll say is you said unrelated with the with the uh, guy breaking the window, and it's unrelated in the fact that it's not related to Gordo. It's right. not related to the like main bad guy. Good point. Yeah. But it, it's completely related, and it's like the last nail in the coffin of showing her what a piece of shit Jason Bateman is. Hundred percent. Right. Where this guy comes and breaks the house, and she goes, "Oh, this is why he had a file on the guy, because he did the same shit that he did in high school." He made some shit up to destroy somebody to make himself look better. And not only that, it's been it's like this is this is now he's been outed to his boss. Now he's losing his own job. Like his life's starting to unravel this and then of his own un, that's of his own doing. And then my I think one of my best parts is Gordo's ultimate revenge at the end of the whole thing was the just like totally messing with Simon's head. Completely. Like you know, you you lie you, when you lie so much. You don't really know what to believe. So yeah. I can tell you the truth, and you might not believe me anyway. So yeah. maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't. We'll just never know. But you can always see it in the eyes. They never show us the eyes. I'm like yeah. God. And this was the. <laughs> I mean, it was the ultimate fantasy revenge movie. Yes. Right. Yeah. And and then again, just in how well it's done, because at the end there, like. You have now watched the video and he's talking to Simon on the phone about like what's going on and you still feel for him, even though you're like, I just watched you maybe molest her and break in the house and kill fish and do all the shit you do. It's his fish. You're like, yeah, fuck you, Jason Bateman. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, They make it go weird guy. That's raping people maybe maybe <laughs> <laughs> the film had the audacity to uh to seven us at the end they literally did a what's in the box at, <laughs> at the very end of this film and they pulled it off to where it wasn't like you know uh, the second time i watched it, i'm like oh my god they're doing the seven thing i think you know at first i'm like jason bateman that was a, that was a masterful performance but then i was like no he's, he's just doing his thing it's just a situation that he's in uh, it, 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 he just did it really well. You know, he did his thing very well. Uh, Rebecca Hall was, was great in this, but really all the heavy lifting was Joel Edgerton because he had to walk a perfect tightrope of crazy menacing. And like Coleman said, being sympathetic and you just con- that constant of, of, you know, evolution of character with not as much screen time as those other two is, is pretty impressive. 
So uh, I mean, he should he should get like all the credit, and he wrote and directed this thing too. So he was pulling triple duty on this. Oh, wow. yeah, that's her character that... is just an idiot. I don't <laughs> I don't care what her shit was. I really don't. I know that they're trying to show her shit, whatever. But strange man you've never met, and you just keep inviting him in the house, <laughs> and then eventually, after you've invited him in so many times, you're like I'm scared, like. Okay, well, you kind of opened the door to all of this, literally, <laughs> many times. <laughs> <laughs> this is so, like, the the privilege, like, the one percenter nightmare, too, right? It's just like, I'm a, I'm a rich executive, and now I have this nice house. And it's like, oh, this underling keeps bothering me. Like, what's more annoying than someone knocking on my door constantly to give me gifts? Ugh, you know? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is like a, a pure, like, you know, complete place of privilege, like, annoyance movie, and that tickles me to death. <laughs> yeah, well, and the fact that Jason Bateman kept... Thinking that he was tough enough that the guy's not going to come back. Yeah. You know, after he goes down and he beats the shit out of him, like, and then goes back and lies to his wife to be like, oh, he was just so appreciative and like, don't worry, it's done now. Like, you just went, this guy that's been creepy as hell, you just went and beat the shit out of him. You think he's not going to do anything? <laughs> <laughs> he's what pushing his arrogant. face into the concrete and yelling at him to accept his apology. Yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> Lord knows that always works out. What's cool too is there's this film just from like a, a technical stand for, uh, standpoint is one of the most unremarkable shot films ever. There's zero flashiness to it. There's no long tracking shots. There's no super zoomed in insert shots. It's not like Seven where you get like all these quick cuts and it's like super like you know fun to look at or anything. There's nothing you know intric intricately like symmetrical. It just looks flat and normal and boring, and the makeup is minimal. Everyone's sweating. She's going on a run. She looks like shit. The lighting is supernatural. Right. Everything is flat and dull, and that's what. And and I'm like, man, this is just kind of boring to look at. But that's what makes like the the crazier scenes pop out when they go to Gordo's house, which doesn't turn out to be his house, and that fucking living room is like something out of like. 1970s like animal kingdom or something you have like all these like taxidermied <laughs> swans everywhere you're like whoa like everything else in this movie looks so like clean and almost like stringent and like i said boring it's like their house is is a place where you go and you don't want to sit on the furniture it looks like a, like a model home or something but then you go to this other place and it's just like whoa even the even the monkey costume you know it's just like that it's so out of place aesthetically with the rest of the film, that's what makes it more shocking to me. Oh, yeah. That that monkey mask was definitely put there to be creepy as shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there's no other reason to make the mask look like that outside of, like, we're here to remind you that this is very disturbing. Right. <laughs> what you're watching. I feel like that other house being set up the way that it was is really just to, to indicate that this is clearly not his house that they're going into. Right. Oh, I was I was totally expecting to find dead bodies upstairs. Something. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You're waiting for it. <laughs> but the fact <laughs> that they didn't deliver everyone. is almost even better, <laughs> right? Like yeah, there's, there's no cake. When they're going, what's that sound? And they go in, and you're you're expecting people to be tied up in that room. Sure, good stuff. Uh, would you both recommend this film? Yeah, I'd recommend this to just about anybody. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's a great movie. I think that different people can appreciate it for different reasons. Um, but yeah, I would totally recommend this. Johnny? Yeah, same here. It, it, if you need if you need a suspense movie and you're not into like saw style gore and guts kind of horror this is a awesome mind bender yeah this is like i said at the top more of a hitchcocky and slow burn it rewards the audience for its patience so if you don't if you have problems with like an attention span you just want to see a gore splatter fest this is not your thing this is no. this skip this uh, and go watch i don't know something stupid I don't, I don't even know what to <laughs> tell you to watch instead of this. Yeah. No, th this this was fantastic. This was like, and, and also like, 
again, all these things for a first uh, time feature director in Joel Edgerton, like he was around the industry forever, you know, before this is an actor and a writer, but like doing the triple duty here. And he's just like, M. Night Shyamalan, hold my fucking, you know, fosters. That's kind of a racist thing to say because he's Australian, <laughs> but he's like, hold my fosters because this is how you do a, a twist, a proper twist. And he just did it and he just nails it from, from start to finish. Um, everything is so effective because it tells you nothing. It unveils nothing. And the only dead bodies you get are a couple of koi fish that he himself purchased. So right. is it a crime to kill your own koi fish? Probably, but it makes it better, I guess. Is it weird to stock other people's pond with <laughs> koi fish that cost a shit ton of money? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> pretty weird. Mm-hmm. Yes. Very strange. Uh, that is our conversation, our review, I don't know, of a 2015 film uh, from the before times, <laughs> The Gift. <laughs> I can't imagine. See, that's a, that's a thing is I can't imagine people – I. I, I mean I watched the, the the trailer to this and it's and it's kind of billed as a more fast paced thriller and so I can only imagine like eighteen to twenty five year olds on date night go see a horror film you know bring the lady and it like they got this like this kind of boring <laughs> <laughs> fucking nothing happening you know like I could see those type of people being mad. And that makes me happy. So go out and watch <laughs> The Gift. It's on Netflix right now. Uh, who knows how long it will be there. Uh, so so check it out before it's gone. I am John the Host. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at John the Host. Let's go around the horn. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnny Mulligans. Where can everyone find you? Uh, you can find me here, and I'm on Twitter somewhere. I'm not sure I remember my handle. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> At J underscore Mulligans, I, I something like that. But you remember where the LaFrog is. Uh, LaFrog. <laughs> Coleman Yeti, once again, thank you for lending us your beautiful beard stylings. And where can everyone find you? Well, after I show John where the LaFrog is, <laughs> you can find me at Coleman Yeti at, uh, on Instagram and on Twitter. And you can find me on the channel Two Bananas Adventures on YouTube. You can also follow this on Twitter at The Cult of Films. I will be uploading this to all your favorite podcasting sites like iTunes and Spotify. Leave us leave us a bunch of gifts. Ah, I can never use that like this again. That was I love gifts. Yeah. Uh, until next time, thanks for something. 